Welcome everyone. We're so happy to have you here for our online assessment webinar and uh, it's just a it's a topic that's so uh, urgent and uh, so exciting at the same time. Um, I think the idea of assessment meaning to be um, to sit beside it, it just is so compelling to think about how can we sit beside our students in this new context and continue to build our relationships because I think that's what assessment has so much to do with is building connected relationships with our students so that we know them as thinkers and learners and we know how to honor their strengths to serve their needs. So with that uh, idea of gaining more insight about feedback and feed forward and developing deeper relationships <clears throat> with our students, we have an incredible uh, <laughs> incredible group of panelists here, and I'll let them introduce themselves, starting with Diana. Hi, I'm Diana Biabout. I'm an innovation coach at the American International School of Guangzhou in China, um, but I'm currently in the United States in Denver, Colorado. Hi, I'm Brent Braco. I am Associate Principal for Teaching and Learning at the high school at Hong Kong International School, uh, and happy to be here. Hello, uh, my name is Amanda DiCardi, and I am currently the director of Level 5 for International School Services, based in Shenzhen, China, but I'm currently in Portland, Oregon. Just really excited to be here with all of you and having this conversation. Hi, I'm Kirsten Durward. I'm a primary years program coordinator at KIS International School in Bangkok, and I'm currently engaged in a massive volunteer project supporting teachers to transition to remote learning via Facebook. So we recently rebranded as the Global Educator Collective. Um, so when I'm not busy supporting the teachers in my school, I'm very busy supporting the teachers uh, around the world with the te amazing team that we found there. And um, I'm so happy that Laura Lynn asked me on this because assessment-based practice has been my passion since I started teaching in 1993. <laughs> so thanks a lot. Again. Good morning. Uh, I'm Ken O'Connor. I'm in Toronto, Canada, and uh, I'd like to thank Laura for inviting me to be part of this. Uh, it is, I think, uh, absolutely critical that we uh, do assessment right all the time, but especially uh, during this crisis learning. Thanks so much to all of you. It just means the world to us to have you with us. Uh, for, for participants, welcome, welcome. Equally thrilled to have you with us. And we're going to encourage and invite you to share your questions and answers in the question and answer function of Zoom. Uh, on mine, it's at the bottom. I think it's on the bottom for you. And then also to share a, a quick hello. Tell us where you're from <clears throat> in the chat box, along with any resources or links that you think would be meaningful. Especially important to note, this is going to go by fast. <laughs> we have you know, a lot that we want to share. Um, but we'd also like to share and connect with you after the webinar. So we're going to record the webinar and we're going to thoughtfully uh, uh, collate and curate the wonderful suggestions from our panelists, their thinking, their recommendations, but also from you all, the uh, recommendations, links, ideas, thinking that you share both in the chat box and with the question and the answers uh, will be shared with you. They actually serve as a compass for my colleague Dana Watts, who's on the call, and John Burns, <clears throat> who's behind the scenes making this all go really well. We use those along with our incredible colleagues from the marketing and communication team of ISS to guide us in developing <clears throat> future webinars and just think about how we could serve the education communities around the world. So thank you and do add your voice along the way, participants, and, and here we go. So uh, our first question is going to anchor around the idea of just the idea of uh, asynchronous versus synchronous assessment. And we're going to ask Ken to kick off his thinking about that. Thank you, Laura. Um, I think that it's really important that we look at what assessments fit with synchronous or asynchronous, um, although I think there's a lot more important things than whether it's asynchronous or synchronous. 
Um, but in terms of those specifics, I think we should focus synchronous assessments on things that are more at the right wrong end of the continuum um, and the asynchronous assessments on those open ended assessments. And then there's a continuum in between. Uh, there seems to have been what I would almost call an outbreak of uh, the first thing that came up in many was uh, concerns about cheating. Um, and I think they've been somewhat overblown. I think, you know, by this time of the year, uh, teachers know their students. And if you have, uh, whether it's asynchronous or synchronous, if students are providing responses that are clearly different from what they were doing for the other part of the year, you'll know. Um, so I, my advice is make sure that you're matching uh, the type of assessment to synchronous and asynchronous and don't get too hung up on cheating. Thank you, Ken Amanda. Great. Well, I'm first, let me just say again, I'm, I'm really grateful to be here. I've been uh, digging deep into my dissertation, which is actually focusing on online learning in K-12 international schools. So I've been looking at assessment for a long time and very deeply. I think that with assessment, there are two really important components that we need to address. And that first one is just really looking at that continuum of formative and summative assessments. Um, now more than ever, it is important to stand on the shoulder of giants. Um, Ken being a giant, Ken, I just called you a giant. I hope that's okay. Um, but you know, we're looking at Gusky, we're looking at Wormelli, we're looking at all of these people that have done the research. Um, and we're talking about those tenets of assessment that are more important now than ever. Um, it is okay to have formative assessments and then have a summative assessment, but then turn that back into a formative assessment. Our number one purpose is student learning. And this is overwhelming for everybody. It's overwhelming for teachers. It's overwhelming for students. It's overwhelming for parents. Um, it's important that we focus on learning for kids. And sometimes that looks like turning a summative assessment back into a formative because the kids haven't just gotten it yet. Mm -hmm. Now, the second component of this really focuses on that empathy piece. As educators, we are um, focusing, of course, on the kids learning, but with such unique times, we need to proportion our, the amount of time we're focusing on that social development. Our kids, um, whether they're elementary, middle, or high school, don't have that frontal lobe development yet and the executive functions just aren't there. So they may not be turning things in on time. That's okay. Um, you, you may not hear from them for a few days. That's okay. The point is to give feedback so that they can continue to grow and learn. Right. Excellent. Thank you. And I love that not yet uh, message. Very important. <laughs> Kirsten. Yeah, I'm a primary practitioner. And um, so oh, the video's gone. Hang on a second. I'm, I'm a primary practitioner. So, it has gone, I don't know. Somebody says the host has stopped the video. <laughs> um, so we really do think, you know, picking up on what's just been shared, we really do think about assessment as very, very, very much formative. And when we think about summative assessment, we think about that it is going along summatively. So when we see that a child has mastered something, that is in itself the summative assessment. So everything we do, or everything that we strive to do is actually assessment. Um, and that becomes much more difficult when, it, when it's online because we can't see and we can't interact with the children um, as, as clearly as we can. So with the very younger learners, the um, asynchronous is, is a little bit easier to design, but we can't really assess very clearly through the asynchronous learning unless we are looking at a lot of video and we're looking at a lot of photography. So it's very, very time consuming for the teachers. With the synchronous learning um, at our school, we are experimenting, as most schools are experimenting now, with the use of um, video chat functions. And we, with the very youngest learners, we do a lot of physical response, so the teachers can see their physical responses. Their physical responses. And with the, the older learners, we do a lot of um, in-time responsing through the Padlet and through the Google Slides. And I recently just found, very, very recently, a wonderful new web, um, web whiteboard that's um, showing us a lot of functionality. It's called whiteboard.fi. And on that, uh, teachers can actually assign an individual, web, uh, an individual 
whiteboards to children so that during the synchronous learning time, during the Zoom, the children can respond on their own whiteboard in real time. And the very youngest learners, if they have access to a tablet or even a mobile phone, they can draw on this. They can write on this with a stylus or their fingers. So that's helping us a lot to actually see um, what the children are able to produce when we're doing um, our, our teaching. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, our next question has to do with while we're engaged in uh, assessing uh, and getting to know students with those kind of assessments in this online learning context, um, goes back to what Ken was mentioning. Um, we've we had a lot of questions about just how to maintain academic honesty and validate summative assessments. Brent, we're going to let you kick that one off. Yes, um, such a, an interesting question. We're in week 11. So we've had a lot of uh, a time <laughs> to be in the trenches and, and working on this. And I will tell you that assessment is still, after week 11, still our number one issue and number one concern and uh, trying to really truly gauge student learning and progress during this time. Because I think we learned early on um, that a direct copy of classroom, face-to-face -face classroom onto online is not gonna work, it's destined for failure. And the same goes with assessment. Um, there, the integrity issue and the, and the, the cheating, I, I like what Ken said earlier. I think that it's been overblown. I think, that, I think that we tend to, as educators, sometimes blow that up bigger than what we need to. I think we have to remember that this is a different uh, environment for kids and that trust is a big issue. And we have, to, we have to trust that kids are going to do the right thing and remind kids of what integrity means for us and that this is something that we aspire, that we hope that our students will take away um, for the rest of their lives. And this is a, another place to, to test that integrity. Um, you know, all the traditional challenges with assessment, with, with making sure that everything is honest, with plagiarism and all of that, in the traditional setting, um, it's just, it's just a little bit more pronounced in the online setting. Right. Uh, and so we put the lockdown browsers on and you put things like, um, uh, you know, putting a phone behind some teachers and just to watch the camera as they're typing to make sure nobody's in the room and all of these things. And honestly, I believe that we tend to waste too much time and energy on that piece of it and lose track of what the real purpose of what we're doing is. Right. Uh, uh, and the, if you're using traditional quizzes and tests and term papers and the same thing that you've always done versus an authentic assessment, more real life examples and real places where they can apply their knowledge. Uh, and you don't have to worry about all of those other things of whether or not they're looking at a book to get an answer or whether they're uh, taking a piece off the internet. They can't do that on authentic types of exercises. And so that's what we've learned um, because otherwise it's just really a cat and mouse game in, in my, it's just a, and it gets, it's an arms race. They find out to do this and then our teachers find this and then they find out how to do this and then they, and it just escalates. Uh, yeah. And I think that energy until the game changes, until teachers figure out, listen, we need to do more authentic. We need to do more things that are project based um, where it's open source. Very few times in our lives, the rest of our lives, are we going to have a test? Anyway, so it's okay. This has been a watershed for us right. for think, rethinking assessment and finally maybe getting into this century, to be honest. Oh, <laughs> Thank you, Brent. And so many important points there. Thank you. Ken. Yeah, I basically agree with, with everything that Brent said, and it made me think of a, a York University professor in Toronto who once said, we train students brilliantly to do the one thing that they'll never do after they leave university, and that's take exams. Yeah. Um, I think that um, I, I wouldn't, Brent basically said it all, but I'd just add one thing. Whenever I talk about this, I emphasize that the first thing that we should be doing is educating students about academic honesty. And I, if it's a concern, and if it's becoming a, an issue in any place, any school, I would see that it's probably because we haven't done the education piece uh, previously as well as we should have. And maybe that what this will highlight is that that is our first line of defense against academic dishonesty, that we educate students and parents about academic integrity, what it is, why it's important. 
And we may need to do a bit of that at this time, but it's really what we've done before, I think, that counts. So important, so right on. Thank you, Ken. Diana. Um, so I would echo a lot of what Ken and, and Brent were saying. So I hope I'll try not to, to be too repetitive about that. But I think this whole topic brings up even beyond the online learning situation that, that a lot of us are finding ourselves in is that um, if we're so worried about the cheating, then what, what, what's setting that up or what's, um, bring, what's causing that? I think th these were issues even before the, um, as Ken, I think, described it, the crisis learning that we're trying to, um, to support. Um, at my school, this has come up. We're also in week 11 of online learning. And um, I think Ken mentioned some, the, the relationships. If we have relationships with our students, um, one, we can help to differentiate and to provide them with learning opportunities um, that can de demonstrate their learning, having those conversations of why it's so important that they're honest with their work so that we can give them honest feedback. Um, if, the, if the focus is so much on what grade am I going to get, I think that's a huge, <laughs> multiple webinars on that, that topic as well. So I think the, this assessment piece is bringing um, to light some conversations that have been happening, but maybe now um, having some more attention to it. Um, our teachers, they have conversations with students, like I just said, to, um, you know, we need you to do this honestly and the best you can so we can see where you are and give you that, that feedback that we need. Um, I think it also goes back to what was mentioned before is what kind of learning um, opportunities are we providing um, you know, the word, the ungoogleable type of um, things, the differentiated, <laughs> the projects, the authentic learning. Um, I think it takes us back to a bigger, um, we need to take a bigger look at what, um, what education is, as um, was mentioned. Brilliant. I mean, all three of you are just highlighting the importance of, of the, you know, student learning and being authentic. So that, that's brilliant. We're going to move on to our next question. That's uh, to gain some <clears throat> uh, ideas from you all about strong examples of online assessments specific to uh, particular content areas or divisions or thoughts uh, of, fo of focus. So Brent, we'll have you uh, up first, please. Okay, well, <laughs> this is a tough question because I know we've got a lot of examples and we could all, we've all, all seen them in our schools. One of the, um, one of the things that I'm f fortunate in my job to be able to do is to observe uh, and to talk with, with all of our teachers about what they've done. So I can give you just a couple of examples that I've been really impressed with. And it's going back to the authentic piece. I've seen teachers really do a lot of shifting from uh, the, very, the knowledge based things to more um, oh, root in science, a lot of, um, a lot of Rube Goldberg type of uh, projects and, and inventing and create just the creativity I think um, this has unleashed some of the imagination in, in some areas that sometimes are uh, stereotyped as not very imaginative. Uh, math, for example, some of the teachers will say, well, I don't know, I, I, you know, we've done tests, we've done chapter tests. I'm seeing now more projects, um, very carefully constructed questions that force them, force the students to apply their knowledge from the rest of the year. Um, to see how they're able to apply skills and grow. So there have been some really nice examples of, of real-time um, teamwork, real-time problem solving, putting kids in breakout rooms, uh, throwing them a question and then coming back to them mm -hmm. in a breakout room and having them collaborate and create, ideate, and, and, and try to solve a problem together like, like they're going to be doing out in the workforce. And it just, to see that more often has been, has been great. Um, humanities, a lot more, oh, this is the other piece that I would say that I've seen in as examples, a lot more feedback um, is happening because it has to, um, as, as Amanda mentioned earlier and, and Kirsten too, that, that is, the feedback is critical, that feedback loop, the immediacy, and because you're not in the classroom and seeing it and getting that intuitive, you, you have to overtly do it. Um, and so I'm seeing a lot more of that. Students explaining, doing a lot more video, a lot more audio, and a lot more conferring, which is great pedagogy, great practice. Yeah. More of it is happening now um, in places where I didn't see it as much before. So I, again, think this is a watershed moment for all of us in education. I think it's going to be really exciting as this subsides to sit down as faculties and, and educators and say, what are we carrying forward? What did we learn from this? And what are we carrying forward? And what examples 
from my colleagues can I carry forward next year more authentic, more problem-based and all those? Because it's happening in every single discipline. And I could go on and on, but I got to shut up because we'll, <laughs> I'll go over. No, I, I think you're so right. And I, I've always said and researched and written about and modeled and uh, tried to share with kids and colleagues that importance that my whole assessment system is built around conferring and it grows from there because it's through those one-on-one -on -one conversations. Andrew Miller was just writing about this in Edutopia that the, you know, the, the greatest uh, assessment we have are those personal conversations with kids. So I think what you're highlighting, Brent, is just the um, abundance of those to be authentic and give feedback. It's me so meaningful. I know Amanda has a, a lot of great ideas too. So we'll uh, pitch you up next, Amanda. <laughs> no pressure or anything. No, no. <laughs> you know, I just, I want to echo what everybody is saying here um, and what we're talking about with all of these assessments across all disciplines. And I'm not talking just about core classes. I'm talking about art and talking about music and talking about PE as well. Right. We are talking about engaging students in their own learning. Um, and we need to be very careful here that we're stepping away from the gotcha moment, um, focusing on that formative piece. Feedback is the most important component of assessment, especially right now. And we, we need to diversify our assessment so that it, you know, the feedback just doesn't have to be from us as educators. It can be that peer-to-peer -peer feedback. And so it's just looking at those few technology tools. You don't have to be you know, proficient in every single new technology tool out there. I know we're all getting lots of emails saying, have you tried? And we're so grateful to the companies for making things free. But find a few things that work for you that maximize feedback. Use, um, you know, use Flipgrid, use the Padlet to post your, your artworks, um, have the kids create podcasts and listen to each other and give audio feedback um, that can happen synchronous or asynchronously. But those are some very important components that happen um, with these. You know, the good things that I've seen across all the disciplines, just put feedback as the focus and giving kids that opportunity to self-reflect. Um, that. Right. That component is, is what's going to keep them going and engage them in the learning, especially if they step back and they're not engaged. Right, ah, such a powerful, all powerful points. Excellent, Kirsten. Right, so I'd just like to step in and say purpose. So whether it's uh, learning we're looking at or assessment, then the first um, part is purpose. My video has stopped again, so I'm just gonna keep talking. Um, it's, you know, once you have, I, I learned from a lady, a very, very good colleague a long time ago, that you need to know two things. You need to know your children and you need to know what they need to learn next. And that's really it. So if you know, if you know your curriculum and you know right. your children, that's what the assessment is telling us. The assessment is telling us what do they need to learn less. So it's a mind shift for a lot of people at the moment because we're not looking at assessment as to, okay, maybe we are in terms of final exams, but it, generally speaking, we're always looking at assessment through the lens of what is the next piece of learning. And Dylan William talks about something that what he calls the, the formative assessment hijack. And I see these conversations going on all the time. The formative assessment hijack is seeing that we do a formative assessment and then we do another formative assessment. Now, we are formatively assessing all of the time to inform ourselves of the next uh, stage um, in learning. And if I may just quickly show the visual, which is actually something that I took from a, uh, a Dylan William, a Dylan William um, website. Right. A webinar, <laughs> a webinar, seminar. Um, and it shows very clearly, and this is something that we can share afterwards, but it is you need to know where the learner is going, where the learner is, and then you design how to get there. And the feedback is very specific on the how to get there. I see people asking questions all the time about feedback and how to give effective feedback. You need to know what your learners need. So the assessment and the feedback work um, hand in hand, if you like. And for us, um, to give some specific examples from a you know, primary practice, um, very effective thinking of reading in particular, because I saw that was an ask, that reading and listening. So with reading, it's about teaching the reading strategies. It's about having this idea that we respond as readers. We make connections as readers. We use strategies as readers. And when we empower the children with tools, and with, as has been already said, 
the ownership of their own learning and the understanding that they are responsible to produce thinking. We use a lot of the visible thinking routines. We use a lot of reading response tools. And you know, now we use this, and we can put any of those routines or any of those um, uh, reading responses inside the, the seesaw, find the child a book via Epic, or get them to use a book that it's own. Actually, what they're reading is less relevant than how they're thinking. Right. So it's shifting away from this idea that you have to read this book and do these comprehension questions to how can we respond as thinking readers, teaching reading as thinking, and that can be done online as well as in, as, as in the classroom too. Thank you so much, Kristen. That's exactly right. And I think that idea that we're teaching learners and teaching thinkers, and we're trying to gain insights about their capacity to think. Uh, as you guys can probably imagine, uh, one of the big wells of questions that Dana and John and I received is around <clears throat> grading and reporting of grades. So we're going to let uh, Ken kick us off on some thinking and wisdom about grading and reporting grades. Thanks, Ken. Thank you, Laura. I, I said that one of the things that surprised me was the immediate responses about academic honesty. I was also a little surprised and disappointed that the Almost equally, the first thing was, well, what do we do about grades? Um, and, and I think that there's been all sorts of wonderful advice about focusing on relationships. In fact, one I saw said, you know, relationships, then engagement, then learning, then assessment, then grades. And I think that really is sort of the order of operations. And another phrase that I really liked was grace before grades. And in many ways, I think it's the the least important thing, as the other people have emphasized it, it's about feedback and about focusing on the learning. But once we've got through that, if we uh, feel that we have to have grades, uh, I believe up to the end of middle school, we shouldn't be doing grades on end of year report cards. We should simply be doing narratives. Um, for high school, uh, my preferred option would be pass and incomplete. Um, and for all the reasons that people have said about the nature of learning that's taking place. If a school feels, if I get in some cases, maybe a lot of pressure um, that they want to make another level, I think the appropriate level would be passed with distinction. Um, no letter grades, no percentage grades. Uh, we don't have enough information. Um, we're not, uh, I think, uh, you know, with all the uncertainties that we've talked about. So I, I think you know, it's passed or incomplete, or it's passed with distinction. Um, and we've set grades, I think every, almost everybody's done that where they were at the time of suspension. And so if it was incomplete, we need to provide students with the opportunity to provide additional evidence. If students opt for pass with distinction, we need to provide the opportunities for them to provide the evidence by which we can determine that. And the criteria for that need to be really clear, okay? I, th I don't, I think Laura's maybe pointing at me. Um, you're muted, Laura. Go, sorry. Oh. <laughs> okay, good. Well, I would, yeah, I agree with, with Ken in a lot of those, in a lot of those respects. Um, we, of course, have, have changed assessment and grading practices here based on a lot of Ken and, and others work. So, uh, of course, I agree with a lot of that. I think that, that the pass fail dilemma, the question, I think it's one that we're all, a lot of us are dealing with all over the world right now. Uh, and I'm, I'm thinking that, that a lot of it is context too. I think we have to take into account our school, our community, what, what is best for our kids, what, what, what they want, right? And um, so yes, there are certainly gonna be cases. I know in our case, this is a big discussion right now. Um, of what grades mean. You know, we had grades up through the middle part of the year. We don't give grades until a course is over. And so they've got that mid-year checkpoint, but now how do we grade this, this virtual period? How do we do it? Our, our teachers have been assessing all along, have been giving feedback, have been giving grades, and the students themselves have kind of fed back that we want our grades. We want, we feel like that feedback is that we're working towards that. But to Ken's point, there are kids that, there are some, not as many in our situation, I know there are in, around the world, it's just, 
it would be inequitable to give a grade to someone who does not have internet access, who doesn't have the tools and the resources that we are blessed to have um, here at HKIS. So um, I think we all need to take our context into location. I think the biggest piece about grading um, for me that is, or for our school, our context that has really changed is we're doing a lot more now of reflection, uh, of student self-reflection on their grades. This is where I think I'm at since mid-year. This is how I've progressed. I'm looking at my formative assessments, what we've done, our summatives, and ha and looking at that, and and then and then the teacher, and then teacher. conferring with the teacher, and seeing if there's if they're on the same page or not. That is happening more now um, than probably it was before uh, in this setting, and so we that that has been a big part of how how we grade. Um, but I, I think, and the other piece is too, to remind everybody that when we're grading in this kind of atmosphere, you can't cover as much. Um, and, and you shouldn't be. We shouldn't be trying to race through our curriculum just to get it done. And so it's forced our teachers to prioritize, to truly sit down and prioritize standards, which we've been talking about for years. But now to truly sit down and say, this is what's most important. Here's the learning target. Keep focused on those. Right. Um, and get them ready for the next level. Make sure the skill development is ready for the next level, whatever that is uh, for them and, and keep it to that and keep it authentic and less is more. Uh, Thank so. you so much, Brent. Kirsten, we're gonna uh, gain some of your thoughts about grading and reporting grades, please. I'm just, I'm feeling left out because I'm, I'm, I'm black. So <laughs> I'm right. just gonna talk anyway. It'll run a little better without your video, probably. It's oh, so, yeah, probably better connection. Um, yeah, so just I just want to really reiterate this whole idea about grading. The research is really, really strong on this. The research on you know, if you give a comment that you can actually, if you give a specific feedback comment, then right. this actually impacts learning. If you give a comment and a grade. Nobody pays attention to the comment. They only look at the grade. So I have somewhere about students being motivated by grades. Actually, the research shows that students are moder uh, motivated by being engaged in their learning, having their learning to be relevant to them and be given specific, constructive, timely feedback that right. empowers them to move forward as learners. And this is really important. So at our school um, in primary, we don't really assign grades because we look at progress. We do have outcomes that are, you know, assessed for each grade level or for specific learning tasks. So we assess progress towards the outcomes and everybody knows what the outcome is. Right. And every time we set up a piece of learning, we establish I can statements and the children actually decide themselves if they can do that or not. And they bring the evidence. And if they bring the evidence and we agree with it, then they get that they've finished the outcome. In the seniors, they have criterion-based assessment, so they do give grades on, on the, you know, the MIP and the DP on, on their various scales, but it is a very similar process. Everybody agrees the rubric, everybody knows what's expected, and then everybody can bring their evidence to the table in terms of what it is. So at the moment, the teachers in our MYP and DP, they're transitioning that because they have to look at what is the learning that's happening now, because the learning that's happening now is different from the kind of learning that we happen at school. And maybe we are losing some of our science content or something else, but we're gaining a lot of other things. So we have to build those things into our assessment rubric, rubrics, into our tasks, into feedback and into our reporting. So we are shifting, we're not shifting how we're reporting, that will still be the same, but we're shifting what we're reporting to. Brilliant, that's brilliant. It's, gosh, this is great lights uh, gained from all, th all three of you, thank you so much. Um, what we're gonna move to now is just a deepening of the critical messages you all have all shared about how important a feedback is. So we're gonna ask uh, Amanda, Diana, and Kirsten to share some uh, effective feedback mechanisms or online tools. Uh, again, just so much about deepening that relationship with our kids, understanding them as learners. So we'll start with Amanda. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, just echoing kind of what the theme has been uh, throughout this entire conversation. I, 
I received a message from one of my dear colleagues this morning and said two things that make her cry. And the first thing is assessment. And the second thing is teaching her own kids. Um, and so I'm, I'm focusing on giving people tools around that. And I, I firmly believe that this uh, begins and ends with feedback. The, the feedback cycle um, actually starts from the very beginning of teaching. Mm -hmm. And that is to involve the kids, to engage the kids in their own learning from the get-go. Um, give them the learning targets so that they know what the criteria are, have them set goals. And it's not just academic goals. It's, you know, looking at their social goals. How are they going to be developing that frontal lobe and those executive functions around time management? Um, and so that gives them the opportunity to reflect throughout a unit of study right. or throughout a lesson. Uh, you know, as Brent mentioned, that the self-reflection um, is so very, very important right now, and I just cannot stress that enough. Um, from that point on, though, it's important that as educators, we see that the feedback doesn't have to be just from us. Um, that is a very heavy load on our shoulders. And so set up those opportunities so that the peers can give feedback to each other. Kids will listen to their own peers, uh, probably more so than they'll listen to adults at times. Um, but with that said, it is important for teachers to give that feedback um, continuously and, and timely, as was mentioned. Um, in this online environment, some beautiful mechanisms that I have seen is, is when the teacher actually records their own voice um, and gives specific detailed feedback on writing. And the feedback is focusing on learning. What is your next step? How do we fill in any gaps that you may have? How can we extend your learning even in this environment? Um, that the feedback has to be directly from the teacher as well and not rely completely on, on all the peers. Right. Well said, Diana. So um, in my role as an innovation coach or a technology coach, um, the conversations that I have with teachers, um, the situation has shifted a bit going to totally online learning. And so um, Amanda's addressed some of these, some of these uh, topics have come up before about um, the conversations I would have, the advice I would have is uh, just with like using any piece of technology is to go back, what is the learning? What do, what do we want to assess? Um, what do you want to be able to document? Um, and we have multiple ways and some teachers are more comfortable doing this. They were before we went, moved to online learning. Other teachers are going to need some support in developing their confidence in using um, online tools to um, do assessment, give feedback and that. Um, also, as Amanda mentioned, who's, who is doing the assessing or who is giving the feedback? Is it the teacher, the peer, um, their self or the audience? Because that's going to inform what kind of um, digital tool they might use. Um, and also really sticking with some familiar tools. Um, for example, my second, our secondary school was already using um, Teams and OneNote, which is a Microsoft platform. And so we really encourage teachers to continue using those or to get upskilled on those. Um, there's lots of, as was mentioned before, there's lots of great offers and tools out there. It can get even a bit overwhelming, but um, we also needed like the grace and the understanding and the, all the things that people are dealing with right now, not to overload the teachers, the students, the parents. Um, with all these new you know, brand new tools. So I think being very um, conscious about what tools you're going to be using um, and keeping kind of a, a, a small set that people can be familiar with, the more familiar, the less stress um, to use that. So I'm coming from my coaching perspective as um, uh, to transition to this online learning environment is to keep some um, things in mind when selecting and using the tools, uh, digital tools. I could give you, there's lists and lists of them out there um, but I think to have some really um, good conversations around um, why, you know, the purpose of using um, what, what your needs are as a teacher, as a student, as a parent, um, and then what tools are you already using that can fulfill that? Um, and what are some that could be really easily accessible? This is a whole other conversation that we could have about how to select those tools and to use those tools, um, uh, particularly in this very, very stressful um, time for, uh, for our staff and for our students. Yeah. That's so true. It's, it is uh, just so thoughtful. Um, one of the things that is uh, to to tap into um, your wisdom more. We're going to go into a Q and A session, and this is uh, a session. Just, just gleaning from um, the questions that you guys have shared today, and I want you all to know too that this these experiences grew really from Dana Watts' heart. Um, 
she put out an invitation to uh, invite people to think about could they mentor and support colleagues as we moved into this online learning context. And we got uh, just uh, hundreds of volunteers, but equally we got thousands of people wanting um, a mentor. <laughs> so this is Dana's brilliant idea is to, to hold these webinars every Wednesday as a form of uh, mentoring and outreach and friendship, professional friendship. So Dana is gonna lead us in um, some time to delve into your wisdom more panelists uh, with the questions, these compass questions from our participants. Dana, thank you so much. Um, hi everyone, thank you, Laura. Um, we are being overwhelmed by questions, both in the Q&A and in the chat. So we're trying to stay on top of all of those. But one that um, one common theme that I'm seeing, um, I'm seeing two ends of the spectrum. Um, a lot of questions about early years, but also a lot of questions about how this will impact higher education. And as we look at higher education, and they're impacted in a very similar way right now, a lot of the universities closed down um, before schools did, even in America, um, the universities closed. But with higher education is just disrupted as we are how can we further the conversation about assessment and credentialing and how do we move forward about the assessment of student learning um, with their universities because they're facing the same thing do we have to um, bend over because of what they wanted or can we start to push the narrative and help them see how assessment can change who would like to take a stab at that first well, I just, I'll just start by saying we need to push the narrative. This is our moment. Um, this is our time. Our um, moment. Uh, this is our time. Oh, I'm getting an echo on somebody. Uh, this to me, I, I think I've mentioned it a couple times. I feel like it's a watershed for all of us, a moment. Uh, we've been talking and been researching and been reading and doing articles and for years and years about uh, uh, assessment design. It, we've got to admit it, it is one of the worst areas of teacher education that there is. Um, I remember back to mine, and maybe I'm speaking out of turn, but it was horrible uh, because we just, it was one class maybe, and it was kind of a side thing. And that's carried through, and we just kind of did whatever was done to us. It's time now. We're given this moment to push the, the narrative and say, this is what our kids can do. This is what they did under these circumstances. Our seniors are going to be more than ready um, for a university, more than ready based on the, the work that they're doing through this virtual learning. They're proving their resilience uh, and, and different ways of doing, improving different ways of doing things uh, and showing their learning. They're ready, they're gonna be ready. And I think it's gonna push, push colleges to, to rethink how they do things too. I really do. Ken, I saw your hand was raised. Yeah, thank you. Um, many years ago, a high school principal in Denver uh, had an article published that was titled Breaking Out of Our Boxes. And by our boxes, he meant the things that we do them that way because that's the way we've always done it. And uh, I would agree completely with Brent. I think what we're seeing happening is because of this situation, a lot of rethinking is going on about how we've always done things. And I, I think, as you said, Dana, you know, the universities and colleges shut down earlier than the schools, and they adapted very, very quickly. Most of them very quickly went to pass-fail grading. And so if they're prepared to make that adaptation uh, in their own practice, it seems to me that it's very likely that they will be far more open-minded about the whole admissions process uh, as things go on. And I hope that we will move more and more to the approaches like the Mastery Transcript Consortium. Uh, and if people haven't looked at that, please look at mastery.org. They now have over 300 uh, public and private school members all around the world. And I think this situation will really help to boost that type of an approach rather than single grades for each subject and horrible GPOs days and class rank. Fantastic. Does anyone else want to weigh in? That's good. Does anyone want to address early years? and how we're assessing specifically early years questions. Um, we're seeing a lot of questions in the chat about how are we doing that and how are we assessing learning and how are we also monitoring that the parents aren't doing the work with early years and trying to make things perfect for, for the outcome of students. I think I can second on to that. 
um, it's it's a, it's a massive in our years. If we're completely honest, we are reliant on the parents. We just got some information and materials through from the IBO today, which was actually instructions for parents. And we we have come to realise as a school that we actually need to give our parents more support and more understanding of of the practices. So one of the things that we did was we set up provocations for play, and we sent them how to set up play centers. And now we're sending them like how to prompt their children to what to think during they're doing when they're doing these play centers. When it comes to assessment, it's very, very difficult for us because so much of um, early years assessment is observational. And we can't in any way, shape or form assess their social interactions, which is a large part of our learning. So the assessment becomes much more limited, but we can assess things like how they're talking, how they're developing their speech, because we can have videos going on. We can assess their responses to, you know, uh, sight word recognition, to, um, you know, finding objects that have certain sounds. And, and, and again, we find the Seesaw app for ours, it is, it's absolutely the best in terms of being able to sort of structure learning. But we're also using, you know, other facilities, we're using you know, listening time um, apps and then asking the children to come back and do reflections. Somebody mentioned reflections and reflections are very significant for us. The child comes on and shares what they've learned. They share what they did. They show us pictures and the child talks. So how do we know the parent is not involved? Because the child is talking. The parent is not talking. That's how we know. But we can't assess. We, we, you know, we put our hands up and we say we can't assess everything we were assessing before. We can't teach everything we were teaching before. It's different. We're looking at different things and we're saying, what can we do? And that's the only way to get through this. Now. One of the things that um, I think we've seen is a lot of schools also adjusting. You know, I think um, a lot of the schools who had moved towards standards based screening and reporting and had prioritize their standards are have been able to make the shift perhaps a little bit easier or a little more fluid than than the schools that haven't had an opportunity to do that and at least that's some of what we've heard from some of the schools that we've been speaking with um do any of you want to talk about the move towards standards based grading and has that helped you when you can concentrate on the prioritized standards and start to reevaluate what is um, the essence of learning and and what we re and the things that we're starting to get rid of it, all along, could we have gotten rid of those things and added more creativity and time? Um, at my school, we had already been in conversations about assessment and standards-based, um, working on, um, in the progress of working on selecting power standards, um, and I'm speaking from the secondary level. Um, and so I feel like we, um, the conversations I'm in meetings with our uh, curriculum director, um, with, the, with the lead teachers and through this whole thing of really what do we prioritize? I think we are already having those conversations. Um, and so that made the shift easier. It wasn't like we we're speaking a whole new language. It's just, these are the things we were already talking about um, along with assessment and, and getting away from just the paper pencil type assessments. And we were already making that shift. Um, so I definitely would agree that it's made it um, that shift easier um, in the online environment because we were already having those conversations, already having um, uh, realigning assessment um, expectations and those type of things. Ken? Yeah, as I'm sure uh, a lot of people know, I'm a huge advocate of standards-based um, learning, assessment, grading, and reporting. And what I have heard anecdotally is that in a number of places where there has been uh, resistance to a standards-based approach, a lot of people are saying maybe, uh, not just maybe, yes, this is the way to go. So I think this hopefully is another one of the things where uh, instead of doing it the way we've always done it, there's going to be a greater realization that as Brent said, when we're very clear about the learning goals, when we decide what's really important, uh, the logical way to do that is to focus on our power standards, to assess, uh, to teach them, to assess, to grade on those standards and to report. So uh, I hope and think that we'll see a, a big move towards uh, lots of places putting much more emphasis on standards-based learning, assessment, grading, and reporting. Brent, can, can I give a different perspective on that? Oh, sure. <laughs> the standard. Okay, because um, the, perspective, the perspective that I have on standards is that 
Standards are great, but not when they're grade level aligned and not when they're age related because this, uh, this applies too much pressure. I've worked in standards-based schools and I've worked in continuum-based schools and I've worked in schools where it really is assessment practice and, and goal-based. And the difference I saw when I worked in a standards-based school was that the pressure on students and, and teachers was enormous and that from a very early age, children came to feel that they were failing because, and in many cases, they just were not ready for that piece of learning. They were ready for another piece of learning. And this whole idea that we all learn the same thing at the same time, I find anathema to good learning practice, to, to, actually, to actually positive pedagogy. So that's great. And we should be assessing children to standards and outcomes and all sorts of things. But I don't think they should be grade level aligned because I think that gives a false perspective on what needs to be achieved because if you really delve into learning theory what needs to be achieved is the next step in learning for that child every child in our care should be in their zone of proximal development and when we focus on this standard for this age group we are not going to be able to do that we're not going to be able to extend our learners because then we're talking about above standards i personally have been told in two schools don't teach that because it belongs to the next year group well, I'm sorry, I have kids ready to learn that. Should I stop? I don't consider that to be great teaching. So I just think when you're talking about this idea of standard-based assessment, I don't disagree with the idea of standards, but I do strongly, vehemently disagree with them being aligned to age, age levels and grade levels, because I think that causes a lot of learning lag. That's my opinion. I have a million thoughts on this, but I want someone from our panel to talk. <laughs> I would, I would like to jump in and just kind of offer um, a piece of advice here. I know that there are a lot of international schools out there that are MAP schools. And a lot of the work that I've done with NWA and MAP schools internationally is they look at that learning continuum. And so whether we are a PYP school or a traditional um, curriculum school, looking at those learning continuums is incredibly important and a resource for our kids and for our teachers. Just kind of agreeing with both side standards or no standards. We need to recognize that kids are on a learning continuum and that we do need to differentiate to meet them where they are at um, so that we can go ahead and fill in those gaps. Um, and I wanna come back to this. The first step in doing that is having them set goals um, and so that they can go ahead and get to what their learning targets are. Ken, I saw your hand raised. Would you like to comment? Yeah, I just wanted to comment on what Kirsten said, and, and I don't think there's, uh, I don't disagree with anything that she said. And I think this is, will actually be the advantage of a standards focus uh, when we come back next year, assuming that it's somewhat normal, that if we have a clear picture of where students are on standards, that will help guide our teaching, guide the students' learning um, in, uh, as, as we move on, because they're all going to be at different places. Um, and if we're just uh, doing letter grades and that sort of thing, we're not going to have that information. But if we have a profile of every student in terms of where they are on the standards, um, then we've got the, the, the place where we can move forward for each student individually. On a quick anecdotal um, evidence, I have a 15 year old, 18 year old and 20 year old. So sophomore, senior, and then a sophomore in college. I have one kid who has literally made two guitars by hand over this time period. I have another kid who has done insane amount of artwork on his own. And then another one who's teaching herself an instrument. What I think there are a lot of things that our kids are using this time to learn on their own and finding their own passion and creativity that we have not tapped into in the past that we need to figure out a way to put into our curriculum. But that's my own little tirade that we'll talk about some other time in the future, but it's time to turn things back over to Laura. So Laura, go ahead. Oh, you guys, this has just been so incredibly edifying and uh, just illuminated so many important messages about reflection and authenticity and grace before grades. And I, I just know that you've brought a lot of hope to our colleagues and we're so grateful to all of our participants for your uh, wisdom and heart and participation um, in sharing your thinking and your time with us. So I, I think that again, as you've all said so beautifully, so eloquently, 
This is our opportunity to make things better. This is the, uh, a time, we've been given this time and these situ circumstances, I always believe for some reasons, most of which I don't know uh, uh, the why yet, but um, the idea of uh, taking this opportunity to, to make learning and teaching and assessment better for all of us, to have better relationships, to have better experiences, I'm a kid who uh, I threw up during my ninth grade Spanish final. <laughs> um, assessment is very anxiety producing. And I think everything that you all shared is the opposite of that. It's, it's honoring children's spirits and their natural disposition to learn, uh, nurturing their capacity to reflect and grow. Um, you've just brought us so much wisdom and, and insight about that. We thank everybody that joined us today, whether it's very early in the morning, <laughs> especially for Amanda and Diana, <clears throat> or very late at night, which I know is a lot of you. Uh, we're, we're grateful to have this time together and please join us. We're hoping to uh, and planning to hold these Wednesday webinars kind of for at least the next several weeks and um, somehow into the next school year. Uh, we want, we're listening, we hear you, and we want to be uh, of real support. So thank you to everyone, and we'll hopefully connect. Brett, do you have something you want to say? I just wanted to say, and I, th I, I don't know if I speak for everyone, but there, I've been watching the questions go by in the chat, and I know there are some very specific ones, maybe to a high school or high school, you know, that, that one or some of us could answer. Please, I think our emails will be available. Right. Uh, please feel free to email us um if there's a specific question for a different level uh division whatever i uh, would be happy to get back to you as soon as we can on any of our insight just incredible people yeah and that's a really good segue into we will be sharing a recording of the webinar and follow-up notes and um, i'm going to let dana close our time together this today dana um, just quickly, next week, same time, same back channel, uh, we'll be running one with um, our wonderful um, uh, um, educators at CINIA um, for special education and inclusion um, and the specific issues that our teachers are dealing with when they're trying to help our students who um, have special needs. Um, and so we've got a panelist of those and then we'll be doing these. We've been doing them each Wednesday. So please feel free, free to look at the archives. And if you have great ideas about um, future webinars, please feel free to email Laura, John or myself. Um, we're all just our first initial, our last name at iss.edu. So feel free to email us as well um, because we're just trying to help um, connect educators around the world and continue to see you guys shine as rock stars. I'm just amazed at the quality of work that are and how educators continue to step up and continue to collaborate and help one another and work. It's an amazing community we work in and I feel so fortunate to be an educator. And so um, all of you in the chat, I'll be in the Q&A. We're trying to answer all your questions. I think we have a total of 62 right now. So it's been tough to keep up with all of them and the links and the resources. Um, but we'll, we'll be going through these this afternoon and send out everything to everyone. So thank you so very much. We really appreciate it. Thanks everybody. You're so inspiring. Take care. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Have a great day.